Welcome. Welcome to Wednesday. So grateful to have this opportunity to be with you. I'm not there in person in the District 8 area, but I am here in Austin, downtown Austin, and looking forward to having this time together with you. So what I found in the last several years of doing the work that I do is every person seems to want to fulfill their potential, to grow, to put out in the world meaningful outcomes. And I think for all of us, we would do that. And we would do it consistently if we had a process where we could realize them. So one of the challenges with that is simply, what are we going to put out in the world if we have that opportunity? So let's take a hot topic real quickly. If you had a magic wand, and when I was there live a year and a half ago in St. Louis, you had a different magic wand. This one would be, what would you create in the world? And I'd love to hear from a few of you. And I think James is going to unmute everybody at once for this one. But what are some of the things you would create in this world if you just knew you had the right process and you could put that in place? Let's hear from everybody. I think James is finding that unmute button, so we probably will hear from a lot of people all at once. Yes, go ahead and tell what you want to create. Shout it out. All right, and James, let's hear from you. You're going to be uh, one of the folks that we hear from throughout this today. What what something that you'd create? And obviously, you're coming to the latter part of your directorship. Um, what what would happen in the world? What would exist in the world if you had a magic wand? Magic wand. I just want everyone to I want to create a world that's that that's that's full of peace and love. Love that. I love that. All right, thank you for sharing those. So one of the challenges that I've seen is when I hear the word vision and Oops. are capable of creating a vision. I consider a vision to be just a description of the way life looks right here, right now. That would be vision 1.0. But we also need to have vision 2.0, that next level of what we're trying to create that might not be right here, right now. One of those challenges though is if I am version 1.0 of myself and I'm looking for vision 2.0, those don't equal. So I've got some choices. I can either lower what I'm looking to create in the world. I can look for a magic elevator and see if there's any possibility that I can just take a ride to the next level. So we aren't at the goal. We don't want to settle for less than what we would like to have in our goal. And there seems to be no magical elevator. All right, so that spells frustration. So who am I and why would I be here? Let me give you a little bit of my background. On the one hand, I was always able to do certain big goals. Like I would say, I wanna to go to all seven continents and actually was able to do that or I want to inline skate 100 miles in a day, and I was able to do that, be a trainer with Tony Robbins, uh, make an album of certain songs. But I also found that on the other side, I was unable to do even the most basic, simple things that you can't imagine how simple they were, and they were just like not happening for me. And it felt like my human was broken. And that felt really, really not good. So it wasn't even that I was on the first floor trying to get to the second floor. I was actually in the basement and going down. So about seven years ago, I made a decision that this isn't what I want. I want to know how this human works. <laughs> we were all uh, afforded the opportunity to run uh, through this world and make a difference and do things that are, are pretty great. And we have to understand how this particular vehicle works if we're going to do that. So I wanted to find out how do we create. And I spent what I've estimated over those five years to be about 25,000 hours. And yes, that is a silly amount of time to spend trying to figure this out. But it was worth it for me because the frustration level is pretty high. Now, early on in that process, I had my brain scan because doesn't everybody do that? Um, and the colors don't mean my brain is partying. The colors just mean the, the direction of the brain through the skin. 
but the representation of the blood flow is what you see. So in the upper left where you see holes in the top part, uh, that's the front of my brain. That would represent ADHD. Like you're missing some of the blood flow in the front of your brain. That uh, plus my history would have just said my concentration is not so great. Well, I'll be honest with you. There's a lot of people in a cohort with that similar issue. And I kind of consider it one of the first qualifications for high level success in some people's cases, not always for me, but there's a lot of people running major corporations that have that. So no big deal as far as I'm concerned. But what was a big deal was this version of it. And if you look in the upper left again, you'll see the diamond pattern. That diamond pattern often happens when you're dealing with childhood stressors that then don't relinquish. So this was me at 45 years old, sitting there with a brain that still seemed to be on full on in stress. And then I started to understand why I could do certain things, but really not do other things. So I went into a process where I said, okay, I need to understand how my human works. And I wanted to understand, all right, how does the nervous system work? How does all of this information that we have out there, how does it work together so that I can do something in this world that's meaningful and fulfilling? Um, so I pulled together a lot of information. I wrote three very simple books just to kind of have the breadcrumbs, both for myself and then for others, to be able to understand how, uh, how this works. But then I still wanted to understand, like, how do I transform so that I can take that elevator and go from me 1.0 to me 2.0, like most of us would want to do, especially if we need to grow into that vision that we hold dear. And what is going to be underneath that that's going to prop me up and lift me to that next level? So I needed a process. When I looked at the American Management Association, the definition for leadership. What I saw was five different actions. And I kind of consider two of those actions to be the most important ones and the other ones are in support of them. So the two that I think are really important are shaping the future. If we have the opportunity to shape the future in a really uh, inspiring and positive way, that's what we as leaders and Toastmasters have been working toward uh, a lot of our, our tenure within the, the structure of this level of growth. In addition to that, it's make things happen because you can shape the future and make things happen and you can make a pretty sizable difference in the world. Yes, you may lead people, which is one of those, but what are you leading people for? It's usually to make a difference, make things happen, shape the future. So I wanted a process that was going to allow me to get to that next level to accomplish my goals. I needed a metaphor. I needed something that would tell me it's easy as one, two, three. Well, I was able to do an easy as one, two, three process, but there is a foundational step. So I want you to think of taking your driver's seat as the most foundational step. If you sat in your car, you would sit there and you would say, okay, where am I going? You have to set a destination after you put yourself in the driver's seat. After that, you wanna make sure, do I have enough gas? Are the tires in good shape? Like if you're gonna go from, I used to live in Southern Illinois and I just moved here to Austin in the last uh, few months. But if I was going to go to California or if you were gonna go to California, you need to make sure you have enough gas, enough gas money, you need to have tires that are good. And all of that has to be in place. And then finally you take off and you drive, preferably in flow or being in the zone. Cause that's just one of the, top feelings that you can have as a human. And it's also the brain chemistry being in complete um, support of what you're up to from a productivity, creativity, collaboration standpoint, speed of learning. So these three steps with the foundational step of taking your driver's seat are what we're gonna look, look at. So it is being the driver, it is having the destination, upgrading the vehicle, and learning how to drive and flow. Let's take a look at the foundational step. What do I mean by take a driver's seat? So now I wanna ask you um, this question. What does it mean to be, in, be the driver in your own life? What does this mean? And I just wanna hear from some folks. And again, I'm gonna pick on you uh, just a little bit, James, but um, 
James, what do I mean when I say um, be the driver in your own life? Hello, Kelly. Uh, for me, being a driver in my own life means that I have control of what I, of the direction I want to go. Mm -hmm. I'm not just way, waywardly going anywhere. That's great. Thank you. And let's hear from some other folks. What does it mean to be the driver in your own life? If you'd like to respond, please raise your virtual hand. It's in the bottom right of the participants window. I see Kathy there. Okay, Elaine. Okay, Elaine. I'm trying to unmute. Unmute yourself, Elaine. Okay, hi, Kelly. Hey, Elaine. Hey, what it means to me to be the driver in my own life is to be able to think through what's important to me and not try to do what I think others would consider my path. I love that. I love that. That's fantastic. Thank you, Elaine. Okay, Mark, please unmute yourself. For me, <clears throat> for me, it's uh, it's about being a master of your own destiny, uh, not settling, uh, being the background of someone else's story, but being the master and the protagonist of your own life story. Nice. I love that. Thank you. Hey, James and chat. Natalie Megan said, making decisions based on what I want to make happen rather than other people's expectation of me. Nice. All right. Okay, All right. check this, number one. Please unmute yourself. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. This is Shakita and I would like to have control of the wheel for my own journeys and where I would like to go, whether it's right turn, left turn, or U-turn. Thanks for keeping with the metaphor. <laughs> That's great, thank you. All right, Cindy. Yeah, I, I like the driving metaphor. I always think of it as being captain of my own ship where uh, I determine where I'm going and um, I may have to adjust how I'm going to get there, but I'm, I'm not just in charge of making the choices and recognizing if it's to be, it's up to me, basically, where my life is concerned, but also monitoring my, my internal world, my thoughts, my feelings, my attitudes to make sure I stay in alignment with what it is that I really want. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And, and I want to hear from more of you as we go through this. I thank you for everybody. I think that that's probably a really nice um, flavor of what it means to be a driver. So thank you for that, James. Okay. So there are a couple of things that we need to work through. We are two things. We are both a driver. Oh, one moment, one moment. We are both a driver and a vehicle. So let me share with you this video. And... There you go. What if you have more potential than you have fulfilled? What if the problem is knowing how to tap that potential? What if there were different levels of power and ability to create and achieve your goals? What if you could increase your power to create your goals? What if spending more time in the zone or the state of flow would help you to achieve your goals? What if being in flow was the ultra creative, productive, and collaborative state and mode. What if there was a path to be in the zone or the state of flow more often? What if you could follow that path and fulfill more of your potential? What if that path brings you into flow while you achieve your goals? What if you were in control of your success? What if you succeeded?
I had to ask her what she was wearing so I could wear the same thing today. So we are all a driver and a vehicle. And we have to understand the difference between those two. When I say the word driver, does that also bring up what we learn a lot about in Toastmasters? Leader. It's the person who's sort of heading in a certain direction or taking an organization in a direction, but then maybe helps to organize to make it a possibility. Well, I can replace those two words with driver and vehicle. So it doesn't matter if it's one person or multiple people, but if there is a set of habits or patterns or policies that go in a certain direction, you've got your autopilot, you know what your vehicle is made of. We'll talk through that. But then if you wanna change where that's gonna go and it doesn't necessarily suit you to go in the direction that your autopilot is programmed to go in, then you have to be the driver to decide to change that direction. And the more that you have the ability to be the driver, the better able you are to do all of these steps, decide what direction you wanna take, upgrade the vehicle, and then drive preferably in a really good state like flow. When you start getting to be smaller as the driver, then all it is is a bag of habits. And we've got to be able to understand what that bag of habits are so that we can change the direction of where we're going. Because sometimes we're just a bag of habits. There is no driver. You won't find the leader inside. And we need to be able to find that. So one of the ways to look at this would be, you are here. If you just go in the direction that you're already going in, that would be your outcome on autopilot. You're going to end up somewhere in a year from now or two years from now. But if you have something more that you'd like to create, you're gonna to have to figure out what that gap is and change the direction of where you would end up. If you don't do that, you can't as a leader, as a driver, move your life in the direction of what you say you would like. And that's part of what it takes to be in the driver's seat. So once you've decided that you are the driver of your life, then we need to go to step two. And that is the destination. You don't get into the car thinking, I'm not gonna go anywhere, I'm just gonna go wherever. You go to the grocery store or you go on vacation to a uh, location that you've decided. But to have a destination every single time you get in your vehicle, and we're talking about this vehicle right now, uh, you're human. Every single time you get into your vehicle, you have to be able to know where you're going. Even a Sunday drive is still a destination. Even if you don't know where you're gonna go, you're heading out in a certain direction. So let's look at this. What do we mean by destination? So many people are uh, looking through their rear view mirror, trying to decide what their future looks like rather than looking through the windshield. Now, there is going to be a flavoring that's brought up as a result of what's in your rear view mirror. But once you back off and you look through the windshield, what is it that you'd like to create in this world? In order to start doing that, I have a tool that I call the flow model, this right here. And it's designed to create and engineer more flow for you based on what you'd like in your vision, which you looked at if you came last week um, quite a bit, and your goals, which are the individual portions that go into um, having your vision come into existence. So if I have a vision, what that's doing is it's starting to change who I am and how I process things, which is pretty important because we were given this wonderful three pounds of real estate called a brain. And every single time that you get a connection in those that changes, you change the outcomes of what you're up to. Your bag of habits is a different bag of habits. Uh, when a child starts out, they have this brain with all sorts of connections until the pruning happens and they go more and more and more in a direction as a human. We have that opportunity to still change. It just might take a little bit of effort and know-how. So part of that is just really understanding how do I change what's going on for me? And when I was with you a year and a half ago for the leadership day, uh, I handed out the protective eyewear that actually flashed. I can't be with you in person at this point, 
but I want you to imagine you're putting your future cam glasses back on if you were there. If not, just imagine this person uh, brought a whole bunch of party glasses with her and that's what I did. Um, so I want you to imagine putting these on. And in just a moment, I want you to think about and imagine and experience holographically the world around you in a year from now. And now if you have a chit chat in your ear that says, blah, 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 I can't do this. Just go out three years, five years. It doesn't mean it's gonna take that long to make that vision happen. But what you want is just to have the nervous system calm down and just allow you to see the possibilities, not the obstacles. So I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds since you already had last week and you spent a lot of time on uh, visioning and it was a fantastic session. Let's just take a, uh, about 30 seconds to, to allow you as if you're in a virtual reality suit and you're able to visit your future and holographically there are things placed in your mind around you that show you that that's the new existence that you're going to have. I want you to take about 30 seconds and put that in place. And if you wanna close your eyes, if you're in a comfortable place for that, please do. So just take about 30 seconds and just envision your life and the things around you that make the vision that you'd like to have exist for your life. Look at your career, business life, financial relationship. Just take a minute to really craft what does the future look like for you if you're the driver of your life. Take about another 10 seconds and just pull some things into this. Just make it fun, like a game. You get to pull into your life what you'd like in this vision. All right, just take a deep breath and now we're gonna just come back. And I want you to, if you did grab a piece of paper and a pen, I want you to just think with writing down four or five or 10 words that if you looked at those four or five or 10 words, you would feel the way you felt when you were inside that vision. You could go back into that vision and be like, ah, oh, this is good. Because what you're doing is you're pre-recording in your nervous system the way that you want your life to look as a leader, as a driver. Okay, so just take about 10 seconds, 20 seconds, write down some words that allow you to remember and experience the way that visioning session went so that you can go back into a visioning session like that at any time. All right. So even if you only had two or three words, just as long as you can look at those words and say, you know what, this is the new me, this is the direction in which I'm taking this. All right, now let's take a look at the next part. So each of our visions is usually pretty, you know, kind of big. It's not just one chunk. So oftentimes we need to go to an equation that is that vision equals one goal plus another goal plus another goal. And it may just be one goal and it may be 10, but usually it's one or two or three goals and you prioritize, how do I move from where I would end up on autopilot to a little further, a little further and a little further. And now I'm on target with my vision. I move my life in that direction. So what we wanna do is use that to make the first goal or goal statement keeping this in mind, that a few of these together are probably going to move you as the driver in the direction of that which you say is the destination you'd like to arrive. So I want you to take a moment and write a goal statement. And it needs to have both a measurement and a date. And both of these are important. It has to hit your nervous system in a certain way. And we'll look at how we change that more into flow or being in the zone in just a few minutes. 
But for right now, just write down on your paper or in your mind, if you don't have a piece of paper right there, write down a single goal statement that includes a measurement and a time frame within which you'd like to have that happen. And it doesn't have to get you all the way to your vision, but a certain portion of it. So let's take just about 30 seconds to 45 seconds to write that. Important to have the goal statement include both a measurement and a time frame. What is your finish line? And you can keep working with this. So we're going to keep going, but you can keep working with this particular statement. And we'll look at how we're going to maybe adjust these up and down. What if each of us wants to achieve our meaningful goals? What if we can only achieve them if we have the right vehicle to create them? What if you built a vehicle with enough horsepower to carry the weight of your goals? What if that vehicle could accomplish your goals at greater and greater speeds? What if your comfort zone is that vehicle? What if there are three parts to your comfort zone? What if you have more resources than you think you have? What if you can use those additional resources to make your goals happen more effectively? What if you knew about the overwhelmed zone that crashes your vehicle? What if you became a more resourceful, high-powered vehicle to create your goals? What if you achieved your meaningful goals? So let's take a look at that goal and see how do we start to improve our chances of getting into flow. Now again, if you've ever remember being in the zone, you just knew you were on top of the world, you felt great, that's what we're talking about. Any moment that you've had that. But in order to engineer that in your life, we wanna use the levers that are available to us by adjusting the measurement up or down by adjusting the time frame, in or out. So I want to take an example. James has, with a whole team, created this four-week series. And James, I want to ask you a question. If four of these Lunch and Learn programs happened over four weeks, that seems to be a pretty good pace for you, right? Yes. What if it was 40 of them over the last four weeks or these four weeks? How would, would that feel? Oh, I would be pretty overwhelmed by that number. Got it. And what if it was just one over 10 years? Oh my goodness. I think people would forget about lunch and lunch. <laughs> Got it. Absolutely. All right. So somewhere in between those numbers, you had the right measurement. Now let's go to the time frame. What if these four happened over 10 years? Eh, wouldn't feel like much, would it? No. All right, what if they happened over four hours? That's too much. Got it. So there is an optimal time frame and an optimal measurement for any of the goals that we have. Just so happens James picked the one that would work probably for all of us, including himself, to make sure that we can get this information and at the same time, not become overwhelmed and not sort of forget what's going on, become bored. So thank you for that, James. So the levers are for you to increase and decrease either or both, the time frame or the measurement. Once you do that, you see how it hits you. Do you feel more like you're in flow? Tomorrow morning, do you want to get out of the bed, throw the covers off of you, or flow, or do you want to stay in bed because you're bored? Stay in bed because you're so overwhelmed and stressed out by what you've just put in place. Adjust what you're doing, measurement and time frame wise, to really work for where your nervous system is right now. You have a vehicle. If you want to have a Bugatti, which is that $3 million car we just saw, the red one a little while ago, you have to work up to that. 
Maybe you start out with a certain vehicle and then you upgrade it and upgrade it and upgrade it, but you check out what vehicle you have and you do the measurement and the time frame based on where you currently are. You can grow exponentially, but just deciding to get something way, way bigger than where you are does not make it easier to get that. In fact, sometimes it goes the opposite way. So that's, that's setting the destination. Now we want to upgrade the vehicle. And what does that actually mean? So when we upgrade the vehicle, we have to understand what of us is a vehicle. Yes, there's a sound effect. So I've had people say before, I thought it was outside my window. No, this is on here. So you wanna get your motor running. And by saying that, I would say, without blowing up your engine. And I would actually say more important than getting your motor running is handling the without blowing up your engine. Because most people don't get their motor running because of how much they've blown up their engine in the past. Their goals were so big that they actually destroyed their ability to get to uh, more sizable goals than what they're currently handling. So let's look at that. This three zone model tells the picture a little bit better than what most people say. And we'll talk about what most people say in terms of the expression that we use around comfort zone. Um, I want you to think about, I have a hospital just down here, University of Texas Hospital over it uh, here in Austin. And if I went over to that hospital and I asked them to give an x-ray, I wonder if I would ever find my comfort zone. I wonder if I'd be sitting there looking at exactly where that is in the body. No, because it doesn't exist. There is no such thing as a comfort zone. It's a metaphor. There is no comfort zone. So when we're looking for it, like it's an elbow or something, we're never going to find it. So let's take a look at this. What do we actually mean by this metaphor of comfort zone? So if I'm in my comfort zone, that means my past experiences and current inventories are equal to my current challenge, the action I'm about to do, the goal I'm setting, or more, and my nervous system can perform on autopilot. It's comfortable, it's easy. But if I'm not in my comfort zone, that means that all my past experiences and current inventories are not equal. They can't help me to handle this. If it's a little bit different, then I might actually go into flow but most people don't know how far that little bit different is and they go into overwhelm. So depending on the difference, you might be doing something that overwhelms your nervous system. That's not, um, that's not a small thing to do. We've all heard this expression, just get out of your comfort zone, no matter where I work, I have clients in China, I've got clients all over and every single one of them has heard this in their own language. Just get out of your comfort zone. Why is that not helpful? because that presumes that there's a comfort zone and not a comfort zone. And if you go two steps out of your comfort zone, you actually end up in the overwhelm zone. Problem with that is there's a mechanism. James, since I'm picking on you, I'm gonna pick on you a little bit more, okay? Okay. All right. Can you recall what you had for dinner last night? or breakfast this morning, either one? Breakfast, yes, <laughs> that's an egg. Okay, all right, so you can see that breakfast, right? Yes. Can you kind of smell it if you really tried? Yes. Okay, now, did you pull out a video camera to take a look at what you had for breakfast? No. Right, because you're recording it. You as a human can record everything that you've got going on around you, right? Right. So you recorded what you had for breakfast, but not only that, we're always recording. I'm recording what's going on out the window right here. And I can recall that because I've recorded it. Now that works except for when we're in the overwhelm zone. We get into the overwhelm zone. Thank you, James. We get into the overwhelm zone. And what happens is there's a mechanism that says, keep Kelly safe, keep James safe. And it keeps you safe by saying, Everything that we're recording right now is dangerous without regard to what was actually dangerous. So it doesn't matter what the person is, the location, all of that. So now my nervous system's like, hey, 
I know we came here before and somebody threw us up on stage, so don't go to conference centers. It has nothing to do with a conference center that I'm nervous about speaking or whatever the thing is. So just get out of your comfort zone doesn't take into account how the mechanism of safety works in our nervous system so that when we do go into overwhelm, we're actually shrinking our comfort zone for future times because these stops just stay there unless we know how to release them. So just get out of your comfort zone doesn't work because it's not nuanced enough. But what is it that does work? Well, we have three areas of a comfort zone. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not. I made this up, but it seems to work pretty well to get a lot more uh, to happen or get a lot more done. First one is resources. And I'm not talking about just time and money, but that's mostly what people think of is just time and money with resources. I'm talking about um, 14 different categories of resources so that if you didn't have any time or money, you still could get all your goals done. If you had all kinds of fuel tanks that were resource tanks and they were full in different ways and you could make a hybrid out of your vehicle and still get your stuff done, whether you had the time or money, that's what resources are. Because resources are necessary to weave with your strategy to get to your end goal or end result. Second, filters. If I go into a car, I'm going to have an oil filter and an air filter. But what I'm also going to have is this filter called a windshield. How many of you are going to get into a car like this and start driving without clearing that filter called the windshield? You're not, none of us would. Yet we get into our vehicle, set out a destination called a goal and don't clear our windshield. We don't clear our filters. You can't get there. And that filter sits there and keeps you from being able to see the resources you need. So if you don't know what the filters are and how to clear them, it's like driving this vehicle without windshield wipers. We have to understand what a filter is. We also need to understand that in the past, we have overwhelmed ourselves because we didn't have a process necessarily to get to that end result. So we wanna make sure that we handle the stops or handle our future goals in such a way that we're not putting more stops in place and shrinking our comfort zone. So your comfort zone is your autopilot. It is your vehicle. This is what you need to upgrade. You as the driver look at this and you say, let me upgrade this. Let me find a way to make this better. Because here's what happens. So many people go after a goal and their vehicle's too small. If this person's heading to California, this is going to be a really long ride. You've got to get a big enough vehicle, beefy enough vehicle that's powerful enough to take the load that you need to get to the end destination at the speed that you want. You've got to build a vehicle. So that is what the three zones are, and that's how they relate to the, um, the three parts of the comfort zone. So you have more control over how overwhelmed you get, or if you're in the zone in flow or in your comfort zone. This is the place on the flow model where you start to change that. These obstacles, when you start listing what missing resources you have compared to your goal, you start listing what filters are getting in your way, and you start listing the stops, you can overcome those, especially if you can see it. It's like having a magical pair of glasses that shows you an invisible rope that has been tripping you. So having your obstacles written so that you can then translate those into actions that can overcome them means you're already upgrading your vehicle. I'm gonna ask you to take about 20 to 30 seconds and write down one missing resource that you can see based on the goal that you created just a little while ago. Take about 20 or 30 seconds. Worried of your directions handed down, down to me. You've got the wheel. It's one missing resource that you can spot that would support you or help you to get to your goal if you put it in place. What if once you create your vehicle to achieve your goals, you decide to learn to drive masterfully? What if 
Each vision and goal you create makes you more capable of achieving bigger goals. What if you could drive your achievements and grow your comfort zone? What if being in the zone or in flow was just a formula you could follow? What if you followed that formula and drove to higher levels of impact? What if growing your impact made you more fulfilled? What if you fulfilled your potential to create your meaningful goals? What if you mastered your ability to make a positive impact? All right, so now you found yourself in your driver's seat. You're actually looking for what changes you'd like to make in the world and in your life. You've set the destination. You're, you're starting to upgrade your vehicle just by going in the direction of your destination. Now let's find out how we can drive toward that destination, feel really good doing it. So flow, flow is just flow. The reason why it was named that back in the 70s and 80s by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the um, psychologist, was because that's what word people were using that were some of the best in the world at what they did. When they went into this state, they just felt like they were flowing like water. You could also go back to Maslow, uh, his hierarchy of needs goes to self-actualization. And similar to the, the top level, there's a lot of peak experiences people talk about similar to flow. We're talking about the same range, being in the zone. So why do we need this thing called flow? Well, a study was done at McKinsey and Company over 10 years with senior executives and they self-reported being 500% more productive. I want you to imagine going to work on Monday, getting everything done that you normally would get done Monday through Friday, up to 700% increase in creativity. And then DARPA did a study on sharpshooting and found that they were 490% faster at learning in the state of flow. So we're talking about something that really does make a difference. Um, Stephen Kotler and Jamie Wheel in their book, Stealing Fire, talk about there's an estimation of $4 trillion spent to feel good that you're in flow, that you are having adventures, um, entertainment, but also at business, a lot of people are doing a lot of things, some illegal, just to feel this way. So why not just find yourself uh, going into flow based on what you're trying to accomplish in life, fulfilling your potential, it's a much, much healthier way to do this. And by the way, it's free if you go into flow by having some very meaningful goal in front of you. So when Mihai Csikszentmihalyi um, created this, what he was saying was, this is the feeling when you're fully immersed, you're energized, your involvement is just um, full and you enjoy the process. You don't even care about the result. And quite frankly, you get the results easier but you're so enjoying the process and it's called autotelic. You enjoy doing the thing just because you enjoy doing the thing. It's enough of a result. Now there's a gentleman um, that has accomplished a lot by putting about three or 400 businesses out there. And what he suggests is that in two hours in flow, he can accomplish tremendous things. So Sir Richard Branson with the Virgin Airways and all of the different companies he has, he uses flow to get there. And he actually does a lot of kite surfing from what I understand to help him get into flow. But there are different ways to do that. So when we're looking at something like this, I have made this model. Uh, just think of it not just as leadership score, the driver score, whatever you want to call it. It's your power. So if you were thinking of horsepower on a car, when you're at your worst, it's minus 10. When you're at your best, top level flow, feeling good, plus 10. Anything below zero, survival mode. Nobody feels great in survival mode. Everybody feels much, much better usually in flow mode of some sort. And all of this is gonna be relative to the challenge. Everything that we're talking about here, it's not just in a vacuum, it's relative to the challenge in front of you. So I want you to think about how do I get myself from survival mode and push myself up into these higher levels well, you've got lower the measurement, increase the time frame, increase the effort to overcome the obstacles. Any of these are going to be helpful to start getting you to take that elevator to that next level of mode, including flow mode, or the next level or version of yourself. So when we took a look at the vision and broke it into a goal, started looking at what's one obstacle, 
I would love for you to just take about another 30 seconds and write down one action, either the one that is going to help you to get that resource that you're short of, or just any action toward this goal. So take about 30 seconds and just put down one action that you can do toward accomplishing this goal. Okay. What if you could improve your ability to achieve your goals? What if improving your ability was like changing the radio station? What if you learned how to turn the dial up anytime you needed it? What if you were in control of creating the vehicle to do that? What if you could learn how to drive the vehicle you have created in your comfort zone to achieve your meaningful outcomes? What if every time you achieve your goals, you improve your chances of achieving more goals? What if dialing up the radio helped you produce more? What if you felt great while achieving your goals? What if you took control of your own dials in life? What if you did that right now? All right, so the, the final stretch here, I want you to take a look at this. I want you to think of this axis as if you did an action and you want a certain result. I have water sitting here. So my action is I want to get some water. The reward is I have the water or maybe I'm hydrated in my body. Maybe the vision is your reward. Maybe the goal, whatever action or goal or whatever, you want this result. If you don't get it done, you're going to have no reward. Then there's growth, which is about you. So you either stay where you currently are or you move to that next level and you grow. Now, if you don't grow and you don't have any rewards, you're stagnated. If you do grow and you don't get rewards, you're frustrated. You're not getting the spoils and you're doing all the work for it. If you, and in social media and Hollywood society right now, this is a little bit more of a, an issue. We want the outcome. We don't necessarily want to do the work for it. That's a lottery. And even if you get it, it usually ends up worse than if you had worked yourself up to it. So this is probably worst case scenario and it is entitlement and it doesn't do any good. I've seen so many people try to make up for where they've lost what they didn't realize how to build and it's, it's far more difficult. But if you can take you 2.0 growth and reward 2.0 as in your vision 2.0 and you match those then you can fulfill yourself to the highest level while you put meaningful goals out there. And we obviously don't want to build a vehicle that's falling apart. So we want to get away from this and we want to get up to this level. Let me just give you one more visual of what this looks like. If I take any challenge, a task, an action, a goal, a vision, an obstacle, and I pit it against me where I currently am, call this gear 1.0 if you were in a car then I've got 100% of my current capabilities with a little bit of flow and a lot of overwhelm. But if I can go through gear two, not go to gear five immediately, but gear two, three, four, and five, after a little while of doing that, I'm actually gonna expand my vehicle and the amount of flow and diminish how much overwhelm I experience relative to my goal. Going from first to fifth gear, I lose all my power. But going first, second, third, fourth, fifth, you start getting more exponential. So my recommendation, ladies and gentlemen, is to take your driver's seat, to learn to set your destination wisely, to upgrade your vehicle, and to drive in the state of flow as often as possible. Because when you can take this process and put these three steps with the foundational step of you being the leader, you being the driver in place, at that point, you can learn to get your motor running. All right. So 
here's what I'm going to recommend. I think we left a few minutes here. Um, and I would love to give you a test drive. If anybody has questions, maybe we can figure out how to apply this with some examples here. I also want to offer you, if you're interested in, in learning more about this, send me an email to that email address, put in the subject test drive, and you and I will get on Zoom and we'll just kind of figure out you know, what you're interested in, where you go, but I can help you apply this more. So feel free to email me. Um, and right now, James, do we have uh, questions or anything that we might wanna take? I'll let you sure. kind of guide this part. All right, thank you, Kelly. Awesome presentation, loved it. Curtis has a question. Curtis, meet yourself, please. Am I on? Yes, you're on, yes. sir. Well, actually, I wanted to comment on something earlier that you said about setting your goals and being in the driver's seat and what it meant to me, being in the driver's seat. And not only do you control where your vehicle goes, but you also be able to make a positive decisions about which turns in life will you make to help you get to where you are going. And that was just a comment. So I didn't have a question, that was my comment. Curtis, I love that comment. That's great. Thank you very much for sharing that. And I 100% agree with you. All right, I have a question from Latienda Williams. And she wants- Hi, Latienda. <laughs> <laughs> She's a little shy today. She wants to know, what are some examples of small to big vehicles? Small to big vehicles? Uh, give me give me just a tiny bit more um, of what what we're looking for there. Okay, she didn't really expound on it. Maybe she can. Okay, I'm going to actually throw something in. The power of the vehicle is what we're talking about. So that vehicle you see on the the screen there, that's a Bugatti, and that costs three million dollars. And the reason it costs three million dollars is it has a tremendous amount of power. Now there's no trunk, so you're not going to carry a whole big load. But think of horsepower as the ability to carry whatever load you're taking. Now, when you take the load of a president of a club, it's different from James, the district director. Elaine, immediate past district, it's a different role. You have to take a bigger, heavier load. And you're taking it probably faster. But you need to upgrade your vehicle, upgrade your vehicle, upgrade your vehicle. If I went to president, I've been the treasurer of a club, but I've never been the president. Now I am in DTM, but I've never been the president of a club. Don't think I'm going to try to step into district um, leadership because my vehicle is not built for that. So the power that you build in the smaller to bigger vehicles, and I'm hoping Latienda that that kind of gets it, is you have to build it according to what you say you want and then you build it for the next thing you say you want and the next thing, and it is just like horsepower in a vehicle. Right. Understood, understood. Any more questions? Raise your hand or enter the chat. So do feel free though to email me and I'm very happy to get on Zoom with uh, anybody who wants to do that. Um, you know, you can, you're welcome to send an email right now if you want and just say test drive and we will get on and test drive this for whatever uh, goal you're looking for. Oh, we have a question from Lamont. All right, thank you Lamont. Floor is yours, sir. Hi, I understand the concept of upgrading the vehicles. However, uh, when I upgrade, trade in my car, I start with a new car. Yep. In your example, when I upgrade, I still have 
some bags that I left in the old car that I am bringing to a new car, which actually prevents the upgrade from occurring. How do I get rid of those old bags? You ask such a good question, Lamont. All right, so that's it. We get a car for three, five, 10 years, whatever the length of the car, but this thing, mine is 52 years old. I don't get to trade it in. I get to just continue to change this one. Fortunately, unlike the metal of a vehicle, like a car, this actually does change when I want to change it. So some of that programming that's in the way, like the stops that you've programmed, meaning I went too far too fast. I jumped on stage in front of a thousand people. Now I'm afraid to speak in front of anybody. Those kind of things can be worked out. In addition, the filter you create, like nobody ever wants to hear me speak, that can be worked out. Because it's not a, an actual physical car with actual material that I can knock on, we actually have changeable nervous systems. So that, even if it looks like it's a strict thing that's in your way, can be adjusted, can be changed. And some things you can have just a workaround. Again, I'm in my 50s. There's not gonna be a perfect uh, change for me that would happen for a one-year-old or a two-year-old because they can change their brain so much so fast. But there are ways for me to do that and to work ar around it. This process that I just laid out sets out the fastest way to give you something exciting to work on. It's your goal. It better be exciting or else change it to be exciting for you. And then to change yourself into the person that would have that. James, years ago, was not a district director as a vehicle. He is now. Elaine is now, right? So each one of those uh, has to be put in place in order to uh, have that changed vehicle to drop what you don't need and to put in place what you do. This process actually makes that happen as you go. You're seeing my dashboard on the right there. You start seeing when you overload the car and uh, when you're not watching if you redline, you need to drive your vehicle in a responsible way, your vehicle, your human, and um, you start to work some of those, those, those knocks and those pings and those uh, dents out. Kelly, I'm not sure if you already answered it, but I'll just ask. So how often should I get a tune-up on my journey in my vehicle? It's, it's first of all, thank you for staying with the metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that if you get into a process like this, what it does is it cleans out as you're going after what you already want. That's what I love about this is I get to get the thing I say I want. I get to grow and I get to go into flow and feel incredible every single day as I'm going there and it's clearing out and tuning up my engine as a part of the process of saying I want this and knowing that I have to identify the obstacles, overcome them, that is the tune up. So you don't really have wasted time where you're hanging out in the garage, except up front where you have to learn what is this vehicle. And that's where I showed you the uh, three parts of the comfort zone. Okay, awesome. Great question, James. Thank you. Don't be shy, y'all. This is a great opportunity to have Kelly in live, live in living color. <laughs> <laughs> right here in downtown Austin. All right, going once, going twice. Oh, we have a question. Martin, let me unmute Martin, or I'll meet you soon, okay. Hey, thank you. Uh, what happened if you're uh, on your journey and the terrain keeps on changing or even worse, there's uh, people setting a roadblock along the way or actually shooting at you? How do you uh, respond to that? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a really good question. So let's just take the simple part of that. And thank you, Martin. Um, if the terrain is getting bad, 
then you may want to decide, let me take a little bit longer. Let me have a little bit lower measurement or let me throw even more resources in there. Part of the obstacle in what you were saying, Martin, was I have people trying to stop me. And in the obstacles column of what we looked at in the flow model, I would literally write it down like that. People are trying to stop me. And I would spend some time figuring out what actions do I need to take? Maybe I have some education I need to learn to find out how uh, people are wired. Because there's some people that are wired just not in a healthy way. How do I handle that? Do I continue to play with them? Do I not? What do I need to do with this? But also, if it's my comfort circle, as I call it, like those five people around you that kind of make a difference in who you are, then I want to make sure I communicate extremely well with them about why this is important to me. And they're about to lose something because I'm going to change my life. We're all like an ecosystem. So if I communicate with them really well, then chances are we can fill the gap that I'm about to make because I'm going to change my life. And then they don't feel as much of a loss. And a lot of times people will stay on the same page with you if that communication is done well and if what, what roles you're filling can be filled in another way so that nobody has to lose as a result of you gaining whatever goal or outcome. Um, and I know we're in the metaphoric uh, world of this bumpy road, um, but in real life, it can be a, a little bit of a bumpy road, but the more that you get these skills to work with people or to spot people who don't necessarily have your best interest in mind, or to make sure that the communication uh, has been done so well that there's no question of what you want, what they want, or you make decisions on whether that it's appropriate for you to share this particular vision together at this time, uh, I think the road gets smoothed out if I can kind of follow up, Martin, with that metaphor. All right, awesome. I have another question from Curtis. Excellent, Curtis. Uh, I'm, I'm, my question here is that going down the same road and you have vehicle breakdown, or you make a wrong turn, how do you make that, uh, one, get repair that vehicle, two, if you're on the wrong road, how do you make, can you make U-turns, not how, but can you make U-turns? The answer to the second part is absolutely yes, you can make U-turns. Um, I think all of us have done that in life, Curtis, and, and I know I'm, I'm assuming that you have, and I know James has, and I know I have, and I'm sure La Tienda is, and um, Elaine, and, and all of us. So the question there would be, what filter comes up? Like, am I losing, am I losing this race because I now have to turn around? That would be yes if we follow social media and say that we have to be competitive with everybody. And that would be no uh, in terms of our concern about that. If we can just say, nope, my life is my life. I'm going to create what I want. Who cares about competition? But I'm going to actually do me. And so a U-turn is actually not even a U-turn at that point because it's basically, okay, from here forward, what am I going to create? So that's that part. Now, let's say that you're broken down. Um, let's look at that as I have a vehicle in a certain state right now. I have a certain outcome that I want to create. You need to bring this vehicle up to that level. And maybe that might be making the vehicle run. That will exist as part of the flow model because now you're going to start listing all of the obstacles that are in your way of already being at that goal or that outcome. And you're going to upgrade those. And all of a sudden you fixed your vehicle relative to the thing you're up to. So we as drivers decide where we're going to go. And if you decide that you're going to go in district director or president of a club or make one speech, those are all very different goals. And you have to have your vehicle just step up to the plate on that. And then you go to whatever else you're going to do and you bring your vehicle up to that level. Does that answer some of that or give some aspect of, of uh, something that you can do with that, Curtis? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you for the question. All right. I have a question from La Tienda. Yay. Uh, hey, hey, Kelly. Hey, um, La Tienda. Hey. <laughs> I think you, 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 you hit on it when, in your last example. So my question was, 
what if the car you drive is like a new Audi? <laughs> You know, if the car you drive around you in your external environment is like as a new Audi, but you know, I know that internally I'm a three year old Audi. I'm still in the same metal class, <laughs> but I just feel like I'm an older version. Gotcha. Gotcha. So then the question is, how do you upgrade that? Um, so when you set out the next goal, uh, and, and James, I've been picking on you a lot and I'm just going to keep picking on you. <laughs> Because okay. this is what I do, right? Yeah. <laughs> We've known each other for a couple of years. So, um, James, you're about to leave the district director role and you're about to create what is step next, right? Because for yeah. three years, you've been hanging out in this progression and multiple years. Um, so whatever it is that you put as a stake in the ground, you're going to mold around that, right? You're going to become that person in this new life just as before you said, okay, let's go through this progression and become the district director. And all of a sudden your vehicle has come to this place where you even said, let's, let's do a four week lunch and learn in addition to everything else. Now that we have a pandemic and all, you know, let's just throw that in too. So you've upgraded your vehicle as you went. Now, when you see what that next thing is and Latienda, obviously this is a same application when you see what that next stake is for you that you want to create, then you look for where is the three-year-old part. Um, one of the participants who has graduated from what I call the Inner Everest Expedition, uh, she and her husband have an upgrading um, uh, vehicle business, right? So it doesn't matter if your vehicle is three years old or 52 years old or whatever, you can upgrade the parts to make it so that it's at the highest level. And then I would also suggest taking a look at the filter that says that it's less than, because sometimes the less than is what puts us down into survival mode. Uh, oftentimes it's comparative. So it's a couple of things that would probably both um, help you to upgrade it, but also help you to see it for what it is. It's a really supportive vehicle and pretty cool class of vehicle and now how do we do those few upgrades relative to the thing that I say I want to create in this world? Is that helpful at all, Matienda? Yes, yes, that's, that's a good, that's a very good example of the filters and the parts, yep. Perfect, perfect, thank you. And, and keep that in mind because social media is not kind to our nervous system. Uh, just, you know, look at it as if you like it, it's a role model. It's not, you have to live up to that standard. None of the Joneses here. Like, I am up to this. I'm creating. I'm not competing. Competing is survival mode. Creating is I'm going to find out what, what this world needs to look like as a result of me, my little part of the world, and I hope for the same for every one of you. All right. Okay, then, very good questions. Thank you all for participating. And Kelly, I want to present to you if I can share. Oh, I can, I can stop share. Yeah. There you go. All right. I'd like to present to you a certificate of appreciation for your outstanding service today in the Lunch and Learn Personal Growth Series. Very educational, informative. I really, really enjoy it. And I can't wait to apply what you taught to my life. And I'm sure everyone else feels the same way. So on behalf of District 8, thank you for taking time out today for this great presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here. I'm, a, I'm an old District 8 or so. <laughs> All right. All right, without further ado, this will end our third installment. And don't forget, next week we have our last installment with Kathy Sexton on about productivity. But please don't forget to visit Kelly's website and, and email her. She's awesome. Y'all have a very good afternoon. Thank you. Take care.